Good afternoon and welcome to this special edition of our talk show focusing on rights and businesses. The government of Uganda has, is a signatory to the United Nations requirement whereby there should be observance of rights in businesses but also in government entities. So tonight we'll be looking into that issue. How can this be handled? So the people who are working, their rights are also respected and not violated. Let me introduce my panel who have made it on time today. I have Commissioner Equity and Rights, Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development, Bernard Mujuni. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, we have Mr. Joseph Vyomohanji from the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Joseph, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Patrick, for having me. Good afternoon, viewers. And we shall also be joined by Ruth Sekindi, who is Director of Monitoring and Inspection, Uganda Human Rights Commission. And uh, she'll be joining us shortly. Let me, let me begin with you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, please. The issue of rights is key. But mm -hmm. when you talk about the business and observing rights, and, and, and now you just want, government wants to make sure that happens, mm. what has been the situation like? What are you trying to solve? Well, um, thank you so much, Patrick, for, for having me this afternoon. First of all, there has been observance of human rights, yes, uh, by businesses, but there hasn't been a framework or a guiding principle or standard that can be uh, cross-cutting for all business practitioners. So what this National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights does is to set a common standard that you can use to measure or to evaluate call it a stand, standing point for you to say, yes, I am conducting business, but I'm also observing human rights according to this standard. So, um, but much more importantly is that we've been having a lot, it's much more than just at World of Work, it's about the business operations, the entire ecosystem of business operations be it infrastructure development, road construction, large-scale agriculture, you know, issues to do with child labor, issues to do with, the, you know, uh, c respecting contracts, you know, it's a whole, whole, whole process. But, but you know, we've always had something called the labor laws. I thought that uh, those are enough to give uh, somebody protection. If they are violated, you can refer to them. After all, uh, you have even a contract, and that contract is that binds you between the employer and the employee. Exactly. There are labor laws, yes, but you know that the standard of labor law is not, uh, is yes, there's labor, but there are, uh, while working, then you find other things. You find the environment. That's what this National Action Plan does. That, you know, yes, you can respect labor laws, but if you violate the right to healthy environment, it might not be a, a labor right, but people are being affected. So, what, what, so, so what is, what is, is the importance of having a contract? Because I, I thought a contract mm. would determine the kind mm. of environment you're going to be working in, but also what the pay uh, and the terms and conditions. Yes, but you know with COVID, for example, contracts became nothing. You had to stop working, that is it. There's a lockdown. Stay home, that is it. But Was the contract still tenable? So Was but it isn't still? That, isn't that understandable? It that is understandable, but you see, people take advantage. You, you see, every time a contract or uh, discrimination takes place, someone else benefits from the same. And every other person is interested in manipulating the other. If anything, actually, one would use free labor if that was available. But you must make sure that you respect the labor laws. Now, what this National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights does is to rationalize, to create a basic minimum standard. Even those who do not have, um, who are not observing labor laws at work, there is a fallback. Okay. Joseph, yeah. uh, how do you ensure these minimum standards are followed and uh, no one violates them if, if the employee does not make it, uh, you know, a, a, comp a compliant, how do you get to know? Thank you so much, Patrick, for asking that question. How do we get to know? And that's really the beauty with us having a national action plan on business and human rights. Its strength is in the coordination of all stakeholders when it comes to issues of business and human rights. And to give my submission context, I would love to remind the viewers that Uganda is a private sector-led economy. We have aspirations to achieve, to attain a middle-income status. What that means is that we have very many development projects, infrastructure, going on across the country from hydro dams to road constructions. Mm. We have very many business enterprises. Recently, Kampala is no longer the city we have as a country. There are very many other cities across. What that means is that business enterprises are going to expand. 
So we look at the interaction of this business enterprise and the human rights of the people that they employ, of the people that are hosting them. Remember, in this country, land is owned by the people. Mm -hmm. So the development projects we are having, we are not yet at that level where we invest in the sky. We invest on land. So when a business enterprise is coming to your village, I don't know the name of your village. Ngezi. <laughs> Ngezi. Yes. When there is a development project, let's say Commissioner Mjun is he has gotten money from the bank, he's going to come and put up a big farm, a ranch. He wants to export beef to Saudi Arabia. Your family is going to be affected because he needs a big space. You have to give way. What is that interaction at that level? Are you able to consent to giving up your property to this business person? What kind of value are they bringing to you as a host community? Then when he establishes in your village, there is what we call the value chain. There will be people that are supplying probably his employees' food, people that are supplying water or anything. I just want to, how know, how just want to know how this new initiative becomes a game changer because I'm still being protected by the laws of Uganda. Nobody is going to come on my land without my consent. You, you can't. If, you want, if there's a government, you'll have to compensate. The game so how, changer, the, how does this change the game? The game changer is in the fact that now the discussion of business and human rights is brought together in a policy document of government. It is coherent. Mm -hmm. So all stakeholders now know when it comes to issues of business and human rights, this is the go-to document. What does it guide us on? Because previously we've been having labor laws, for example, you're looking at the situation of people working in these business entities. But to what extent have they achieved? Okay. And from... The commissioner will speak but to this, but the government of Uganda underwent a regulatory impact assessment, mm. looking at all those things. Yes, we have these laws. What if we do nothing? But investment is coming at a terrific speed, so regulation has to catch up. And that's yeah. why we have this National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. For all investors out there to know that in as much as our dear president loves them so much, he keeps saying, my investors, he also loves the citizens of Uganda. But that's why... The government of Uganda has led this process of developing a policy document that we shall look to when we are looking at relations of business enterprises. My problem, the my problem with Uganda is not we don't lack policies. We have a lot of them. But let me introduce other, another panelist who has just joined us. <laughs> Ruth Sekindi, a Director of Inspection and Monitoring at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. The last time I checked, that was your job. I still <laughs> hope you still <laughs> do. Yes, right. okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us. Ruth. Thank you. For and uh, you are Director of Inspection and Monitoring. I'm sure you have an understanding of what the situation is like, violation of rights among employees. What can you tell us? Okay. And how will this solve the issue? Okay, I'm going to speak about the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights mm -hmm. in a broader way and just give examples. Um, Uganda is among the few countries that, are asp that we're aspiring to have this document. Now, as a country, we know that we have the sustainable development goals and we all want uh, looking at uh, a, a, a very fancy uh, a mid, well, mi or should I say mid-scale or uh, uh, we want to be second class or whatever it is. Middle class. Middle class mm -hmm. by the time we, in, we, we get to 2020, 2030. And we anticipate that uh, if we are going to get there, investment is very key now. We have been seeing investment coming in and people starting all sorts of businesses. That is good. It's good for the economy. It's good for Ugandans because they get jobs. But then it has other aspects that we have to look at. The environment is degraded. If we are drilling oil, then we, are, we may affect the environment with the wildlife. If we are, we are into uh, stone quarries and mining gold and diamonds and uh, uh, marble, all, the, all that affects the environment. But nobody it is going to give you a license to do all those jobs without an environment uh, impact assessment uh, uh, that is what I'm, I'm going to link it in. Yes. from NEMA. Absolutely. Because at every level, a Ugandan or a business or a community is protected by different laws. So I'm wondering when you bring another policy and you put it on top of those already existing now and probably they're not being used to protect you guys. Patrick, this is not a law. It's a policy document. Yes. And I want, I want you to, to, I want the Ugandan listening in to first appreciate where we're coming from. And so um, other than the, the environment, their customers, 
Now, we have been seeing people who, and, and we're not talking about multilateral companies. Even though we know that businesses can be very powerful, companies like Amazon's are three times or five times Uganda's GDP, okay? Uh, companies like Total Uganda, I mean, you can't compete. So when you have powerful companies coming into your country, the things that you have to do, now, uh, we also look at the customer protection. You have heard of aflatoxins in maize. The ordinary man who does not know that he's doing business is actually doing business. Who checks this ordinary man who grows his, his maize, uh, 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 dries it, and then sells it, and instead it is causing cancers? What about the beef that is infected with, uh, uh, what is this thing that uh, is used for bombing bodies? And they, that's the way they are preserving it. What about the fish, okay? Uh, the, uh, if you look at our tomatoes on the markets, now I'm breaking it down to the ordinary Ugandan to something that they understand. The tomatoes, they're using pesticides to preserve the tomatoes. But then a child will get it and eat it. And all that affects the body. Now, we are seeing many people into businesses. And we have realized that businesses affect human rights. Whether it's employment, whether it is issues of health, many people are in hospitals because of everything that they're consuming. What about the environment, the pollution that we are seeing? Now, there are laws that we have. But as a country, you have said we have excellent laws. But what about enforcement? And we realize that there is discoordination among the institution. So the Uganda Investment Authority brings in the, 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 the investors. And then Ministry of Trade, they work together. So very fine. You have a bilateral agreement with this company. But how is the Ugandan uh, protected out there? And do businesses know about human rights, the fact that what they do affects human rights? Now we are bringing in not the legal aspect, but the human rights angle. And that's where we are looking at issues of environment. What about issues of vulnerability? The women. I was telling you, I, I can tell you that women, when they are mining stone, uh, sorry, salt, they have to put, uh, to pad themselves with, with, with cassava. What about issues of women? Issues of vulnerability where we, 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 we chase away ethnic minorities just to make sure that uh, 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 we, we create room for investment. So it is all those things that need to be tightened, uh, neatly tied together because the laws are there, but the institutions are split. So they are not working together. Parliament is discoordinated, it's not coordinating with investment authority. Investment authority may not be working very close with. So, okay, so this so is the policy, so and, and, and I get that, and, and, and Ugandans have understood that. Yeah. You are a lawyer by background, I suppose. And you understand why is it that even what is existing has not been fully enforced? When you bring this policy, is it going to be respected? Yet there have been laws. Actually, even laws are, are stronger than policies, I suppose. Yeah. And yet they have not been enforced. Okay. Now, under the, 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 this policy, the different ministries, departments, and agencies are given tasks and roles mm. so that they have to ensure the enforcement not only of the laws but of the policy. Now, we have the, what we call the United Nations uh, uh, Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And the state is required to, uh, or businesses are, are required to ensure that there is respect, protection, and remedy of rights. So now this policy is bringing in that human rights aspect where all businesses will be required to respect human rights, but most importantly to remedy in the event that there is an issue they're supposed to remedy. I handled a case, or the commission handled a case, where um, uh, there was a stone quarry uh, somewhere that I will not mention. And before we, the, the community knew it, the women were having uh, miscarriages. Houses were having cracks. Sto uh, uh, cows were not also uh, uh, giving birth and the guts. And before they knew it, we, they had to run. I mean, where do you, you report? Under the law. Where do you go? How can well, you say that my cow is not uh, coughing? Well, you understand? But it's, it's coming from pollution. So you need yeah, something you know, else. You know, there's something called noise pollution. Uh, yes, and is exactly. There's the even environmental police. But it is so hard to address some of these issues with the existing legislation. Mm -hmm. So we are saying let all the institutions that have wide mandates come together, address, sensitize, monitor, remedy, and create awareness for businesses 
and the communities. So, Bernard, okay, yes, Bernard. Yeah, you know, the, the, the whole thing about the business and the, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is supposed to encourage self-regulation. You are not supposed to go to enforce and then clamp down and, you know, push people to, 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 to observe. It's supposed to create a culture of observance. You see, it's supposed to look at people profit. Don't put profit before people. Otherwise, you'll just exhaust the human resource, and then you'll be a bad, irresponsible investor. It's looking at responsible investment. Are you eliminating child labor? Are you addressing issues of gender equality at world of work? Are you considering, for example, post-trauma now under COVID stress? Mm. Are you giving psychosocial support to people probably who have um, uh, people living with HIV AIDS? Are you helping them to access uh, med med medical care? You know, these are some of the tenets. But much more importantly is that it looks at corporate social responsibility, which is actual and which is legitimate. Some of the entities might manipulate their um, corporate social responsibilities to promote brand equity, to, to, to enhance their brand at the expense of the vulnerable groups, for example. And then it's looking also at uh, the first prior and informed consent. You are going to invest, yes, you want uh, Mabira Forest, okay, for example, okay? So what do you see that actually it balances off with the environment vis-a-vis -vis people's interests? Is it a responsible investment? You want uh, bung bu Bungoma, okay? Is that uh, making Bungoma, sense? Which, Bungoma. Mm. Bungoma yeah. Forest. Bungoma Forest. Which actually okay? is a yes, in the news right ex now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Is it making responsible investment? Okay? So this is the balancing scale. Th so this action plan actually creates a yardstick within what you can look at and say, yes, I think I'm making responsible investment. And also, am I paying taxes? Because you know, most entities actually don't, no one wants to pay taxes. Yet everyone wants to use uh, public facilities, good public facilities. So this action plan puts it in the context that, yes, if you pay taxes, if you do statutory contributions, pay NSSF, pay, you are creating a responsible investment in this country and you're adding value. So, uh, uh, Joseph, ma we have a problem in this country and it's called the lack of implementation bag. How is this going to be implemented fully so that... Uh, uh, at an, the, the United Nations guidelines on business and human rights, which Uganda is adopting, can be meaningful. Thank you so much for that question. I would love to use the example of COVID-19 and the social services delivered by private actors. You're saying we have all the laws and everything, but just recently, when medical bills were so high for mm -hmm. even those that thought were above mm -hmm. middle class, mm -hmm. where a COVID patient has to pay 400 million for, mm -hmm. for a private hospital, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health came out and told you, I can do nothing about this. Don't we have the laws? Don't we have the Public Health Act? But the beauty in having a national action plan on business and human rights is that it clearly maps out the roles of the ministries, departments, and agencies, but not only them, also actors. the businesses, the non-state yeah. actors. Mm. It's not all about you obtaining a license from whichever regulator to come and provide services, a medical service, you have an obligation to respect the human rights that comes with it. When Patrick Kamara, who is not even a doctor, chooses to set up a hospital in Chenjuj, you're looking at the profit. You're saying, mm, there is a gap here. We don't have a health facility. Let me set up this uh, clinic. Make money. But that's not the essence. We have a right to the highest attainable standard of health as human beings. Mm. So mm. the regulation then is strengthened by having a policy document, which is the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, that will speak to you, the investor, whose mind is stuck on profit, to know that it's not all about profits. They are human rights. If you're dealing in the social services, for example, health education, just recently, the Association of Private Schools went to Parliament and they were asking for money to revamp their schools which ideally would be okay. But then the question was from the members of parliament, so are you willing to also reduce on the high school fees? And their response was like, no, 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 we will not. We want this money such that only parents who can afford our services can mm. bring their children to these schools. But then the human rights aspect would now look at the aspect of the right to education for all and would then advise but, government but Joseph, to Joseph, take Joseph, all that money mm -hmm. to public schools Joseph, such that all of us can pub get. Are you public schools, Joseph, are you aware that today government-aided schools 
are sometimes asking more money than purely <laughs> private. And that is the challenge. <laughs> and, and, and you guys are human rights defenders. True. Government aid the school asking for more money mm. than private private. That is the greatest challenge we are having. Currently, we are having engagements with the Ministry of Education to regulate the sector. It has been a, a big gap. It's very embarrassing to say that the duty bearers are actually also private owners of these schools. So who then does the arbit arbitrary? So we are pushing and working with them to ensure that there is regulation of private actors in the education sector. This is something that should interest the Minister of Education. Because when you get taxpayers' money mm. and aid a school whose foundational body could be a church, I'm a Christian, or the Islamic faith, and then the fees are way so high, to what extent are you enabling that's, that's, that's a Ugandan? Think about all the major it's, it's schools uh, mm. that have high name recognition mm. that are now running. I mean, they ask... Uh, you pay through the nose, mm. but yet they are called government aided. And that's why we say we need equity yes. in accessing but this education. Is where, this is where Joseph comes from, mm. you know? Mm. Yes, <laughs> and that's where I come this from. Is this is but where we need to have the conversation. Yeah. We need mm. to have this mm. conversation mm. because mm. businesses are always place profits above everything else. With this policy document, mm. now we shall look at the aspect of human rights and mm. look at this interaction mm. of the business enterprise Vis-a-vis -vis the rights the of Ugandans. So, Ruth, is, if this national action plan on business and human rights eats into the profit margin of an investor, will mm -hmm. they have one issue? When we talk human rights, under human rights principles, there are elements of human rights where the state is required to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. Mm -hmm. Now, in the protection of rights, the state or government is supposed to t protect us Ugandans from third parties, including businesses. For example, you saw during COVID, the COVID situation, who, how many Ugandans could afford a million per week mm. to attend to a patient? Because they felt that the private hospitals were full mm -hmm. and sometimes they're looking for quality uh, quality and privacy. So they opted for private hospitals. Unfortunately, the private ho hospitals were very expensive. It, it, the same uh, uh, scenario goes back to education. Mm. How many people can afford a good school? And but yet, if, if you can pause there, are you aware, really, mm. gentlemen and lady, mm. that the health system has always been like that? that has always been expensive, but that because when COVID came in Definitely. and everybody was going to, to the hospital, then we got to know what was happening. It has always been hard for somebody to get admitted in a private hospital in Kampala for a week, you can even sell your land. That has been the issue. Only that now, people in positions of responsibility have realized, okay, <laughs> this is what we've been going through. I, I'll use, uh, I, I think I was with you when uh, <laughs> Professor Mbazira, my good friend, yes. argued that Ugandans for a, a while have been finding solutions to their problems. <laughs> so that if the health sector is crumbling or having issues, they know that I can use my money and find a solution for, by going to a private hospital. If the education system, I think, is, very, is not sufficient, we can establish a school and we take our children there. But I think the state has to take back, or, uh, and I'm glad they are doing so, to take back their role in ensuring quality. And back to uh, the issue that you're uh, raising, when we're saying that we should not leave anyone behind, the state has a duty of care mm. towards the Ugandans. Mm. It has a duty of care to ensure that we Ugandans are protected against third parties who exploit them. So if we're talking about leave no one behind, we should ensure that all children, wherever they are, access the same quality education, no matter the remotest village that my, my grandmother lives. Mm. It shouldn't really matter. What matters is that if you decide to go into a public sector where you're offering a service, the quality and the cost should not be exorbitant. So that is why we're saying mm. let government moderate and regulate the prices of some of these things mm. and that if you you venture into a sector mm. where you're offering a service or so whatever it is to the public quality matters make sure that you do not harm your customers make sure that it is uh, it does not affect the environment make sure that women 
and persons with disabilities are not ignored, they are brought on board so that we don't have any groups that are left behind. So it is the state's duty, and that is why government signed off or cabinet signed off this uh, uh, national action plan, because it is a linkage in ensuring that when it comes to businesses, there shall be a holistic approach, all MDAs will be involved. So there is accountability and uh, uh, assurance of mm. quality and, 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 and good services for all. Most of the businesses we have, mm. um, small scale and all that, some of them are very informal, you know, and uh, employing people. So how do you even look at those capture those who are informal. There's too much informality in Uganda, mm -hmm. Bernard. Yeah, but uh, you know, Patrick, that uh, informality does not m make you illegal, okay? It, it is still impacting on human rights of the people. And the informality we are talking about could be the precursor to disaster to the community at the same time if they don't comply. Because that means they'll bring substandard goods to the market, you'll consume. They'll bring lira lira, huh? Changai. <laughs> they'll take it, you'll bl go blind. If, 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 <laughs> if, 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 if they'll bring like a form rock boom they and it will bust your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Is it rock boom or sorry? Uh, uh, you not, I hope you're not, not rock boom. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That. Something <laughs> of that nature. Okay. <laughs> I, I, draw that. I could be sued and I don't, and I, I can't pay a million dollar here. So, uh, but what we are talking about is it enhances corporate governance. It enhances equitable business, you know, approach to profitability. You know, uh, it makes sure that even the, the small players, government recognizes them in their way, the way they are. Okay. It doesn't leverage them. So Joseph, the uh, the again, it's the high standard like other big players. The National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights sounds so good, but I'm wondering how the government full soldiers are going to find people in plantation agriculture mm. or maybe they're going to find that maid who is working. I can imagine every home in this Kampala has maybe a maid who have been turned into beasts of burden. How do you get to them? Thank you. I wanted to first respond to the question of the cost. With you respecting human rights, it's a cost so it reduces your profit margin as a private actor. And make it clearly known to our viewers and you, Patrick, that when you look at human rights as a cost that you don't want to incur, then the question of sustainability of your business comes into disrepute. The moment you don't respect human rights, then your employees are going to try to destroy your materials, they're going to try to cheat you. You have to hire military men, private soldiers to come and protect your business, which is not sustainable. Mm. So to speak about the question of sustainability, just like our processing plants look at raw materials as a cost. The need to respect human rights requires resources. So in the business plan out there for any investor seeking to come to Uganda or those mm. that are local mm. and are working here, you need to look at the aspect of complying with human rights as a necessary cost because without that compliance, we don't have sustainability. Mm. The moment you abuse people's rights, you have seen conflicts that result from land eviction. When you evict a whole village to put up a sugarcane plantation, for example, people will retaliate. And your money, your million dollars that you would have put there in a processing plant and putting up in the plantation will go to waste because you're fighting. The easiest way to obtain a social license for private actors that are setting up businesses across this country is to respect human rights. That way, the business will live in harmony you know, with mm. the citizens. You know, Patrick, uh, one time we were in Ntungamo celebrating Labor Day, and then the, the Ntungamo covered the road was being repaired, um, tarmacked. But almost 30% of the materials for the roads were being stolen every day by the people, by the communities, because the people thought this was not their road. It was the company road. Just the way you have heard, these are oil roads. You see, when you don't put <laughs> people at the core of investment, you risk. I don't know what, how, what you can do for you people see, like those. You risk. Whether you explain no, to no, them. No, 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 no. It's about. I mean, those are lack of values this in the community. Business really. plan, <laughs> this business, business plan. This business plan. Look, this business plan stipulates that before you put an investment, even a project, make sure people buy into it. Let them know that this is their road, it's not oil road. Because the road is supposed to help people, the community, to access markets, to enjoy, to go to school, to, you know, to deliver their products. Some metals on the Entebbe Express way exactly. have been taken off it, by people who exactly. are selling them through scrap. Yes. I, I mean, people know mm -hmm. the importance of a road, but they still 
Because that, of lack of values, they will still, they will still <laughs> anyway. It, it emphasizes the values. <laughs> values is very important because this also brings in the aspect of values, business values. What, do you, what are your value propositions? As, as a business entity, what do you stand for? So, and as much as you know that you're going to make money, make profit, let the people be part of it. Make them be aware that, you know, you're planting a forest here. Yes, you're mitigating on climate change, carbon emission and all that. But also, people can access, they will get firewood. You know, you're not necessarily just coming in as an imposter. And then people will not burn your forest. Okay, so yeah. Ruf, are we likely to see... Uh, agencies of government maybe also taking through the business entities in some form of, or you know, sensitization. Mm. Is that happening yes. so that so that they too can actually buy into it? One of the deliverables of the national action plan is sensitization, not only for government agencies but the population mm -hmm. and the business companies or agencies and uh, other stakeholders, civil society and all that. Why? Because when we talk about business and, and human rights, it's really alien mm. to many people. If you're going to invest, any Ugandan investing, do you ever first think about human rights? Mm -hmm. You're just thinking about the profit margin mm. and the taxes mm. you're going to pay mm. and the space you're going to put uh, your business and how your business is going to grow. The things that you uh, don't think about, but maybe, and if, and if you do them, you do them unconsciously that I have to pay stuff uh, monies. But we're saying that uh, businesses, wherever they are, they have, whether small scale, mid, uh, medium scale, or, 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 or large scale, multilateral, there is a threshold that they have to meet. Because we have noticed that, uh, uh, let me just even leave the, the Ugandan businesses, but the investors, sometimes they come and they compromise on the quality mm -hmm. that they offer Ugandans. And yet in other countries where they do business, they emphasize on quality. The staff uh, have good remuneration, uh, the way they are treated, uh, the, the, the promotions are better, you know. But when it comes to Uganda, then they have selective application. To an extent that there's a company where, I won't mention it, where a particular group of people, wherever they came from, they ha have toilets, just like it was in South Africa. Toilets for this kind of people, category of people. Ugandans, you don't cross. So, uh, and when we monitored, we find, we, f we find such things. So the question, is, we're saying um, when businesses come to Uganda or the UNs in Uganda, there's, there's, there are particular standards that they have to meet. There are particular rights that they have to observe. Issues of discrimination, issues of uh, the environment, issues mm. of customers, mm. issues of vulnerability, uh, gender, women, mm. all those have to be taken into consideration. Mm. Even right now, mm. uh, Bernard, mm. in government entities, agencies and departments and ministries you'll find people of the same qualification almost doing the same job uh, y you know s but not equal pay mm. what brings that in fact if, if there's an engineer in the mm. ministry of water and another engineer maybe in Nema and maybe an engineer in UNRWA and these are all employees of government same qualification mm. same work but disparity in pay well um, but, 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 but Patrick there are common standards for scientists. Scientists get the same pay across the board in the mainstream service. But the issue is with those, some of the authorities which are allowed by the Act of Parliament to st set their own, you know, renumulation. That's where the difference comes in. But otherwise, the mainstream government, if they are scientists, same amount. If they are, you know, same, same, same. Now, the issue of inequity is a big issue. We can't start it and finish it here. But what I wanted to but again but say... But it's related in the, yes. in the policy that now... <laughs> it is, it is. Go government is a bi one of the biggest to Joseph business players. This because also <laughs> this is right within their docket. Yes, exactly. But you see, Patrick, I want to give you an example. It's not only government. When, while I was a, um, assistant commissioner for labor in this country, I arbitrated a particular case where someone lost a manhood because he used to be near... A furnace in one of the steel manufacturing companies. Are you for you? Yes, <laughs> and it got lost. It got lost. This was the, uh, the this w this matter came before the medical arbitration board, and people are saying, ah, oh, that's how he's a disabled person, a person with a disability. That's how he was born. The man said, no, I had my thing. The thing got lost, and I'm telling you, the wife left. His family was in, in shambles, and this was a matter, and the employer was denying. 
But the man, when they examined him, because of too much heat at the furnace where they, they, they really burned the, the steel and turn it into bars and all that, he had less protection. And this was real. So in, 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 uh, this particular action plan brings this particular matter but square. Do, but but, but don't, you, don't you believe that we have uh, agencies mm. that should have protected this man? that you do have looked into his rights yes and they didn't you bring this policy and i'm wondering whether it can even become a game changer yeah, look you see there is a common denominator between what what cuts across uh different entities of different power dimension i mean you cannot for example you create someone who's making cottage factory soap from behind the garage but with 10 people to someone like uh, mukwano industries small to billion, you know? But they all have to be measured against a common standard. Now, what this action plan does is to annex or harvest the hard, hard corn and make it soft for chewing, for the common uh, uh, informal or formal business practitioner to easily implement some of the minimum core standards of respecting human rights. That yes, you might not afford to, to, to guarantee insurance for your workers, you might not, but make sure the environment is safe. If you cannot uh, guarantee the right to health, you know, good insurance, packages, premium, you know, in case of death, in, but let someone be less exposed to the possibility of dying while working. And how do you uh, do that? This action plan, common why, standard. Why, why don't across. you think about creating some kind of yeah. civic competence, people to know their rights and know their responsibilities, and then they will be of value to their organizations, but mm. also the organization would, would not, you know, try to uh, violate their rights. And that's indeed exactly our role when it comes to the implementation of this national action plan. Civil mm. society organizations working on issues of business and human rights, mm. together with the Uganda Human Rights Commission, mm. are tasked in that national action plan mm. to build the civic competence of Ugandans to actually understand that this is an abuse of my right mm. and this is what I need to do about it. Mm. But speaking to why the national action plan is a game changer is that most of the laws we have are stuck in that traditional understanding that mm. issues of human rights are a duty of the state. Mm. What the National Action Plan and Business and Human Rights brings on board is that all stakeholders are now looked into. This struggle to ensure that there is respect of human rights by businesses, in as much as you're thinking about your profits, you have an obligation to respect human rights. So on top of the remedy mechanisms we have that are really largely focused on the state infrastructure, the courts of law, uh, le industrial court, labor officers, <coughs> Uganda Human Rights Commission, Opportunities Commission. We want to work with businesses to also set up grievance level mechanisms in mm. their establishment, those that are big, mm. to be able to have functional policies in their institutions such that if I'm a victim of sexual harassment, mm. the human resource of, let's say, NTV Uganda has a policy that would direct them on how to deal with this issue mm. because my rights are being abused mm. at a place of work. Mm. Can that come up? That's the game changer that the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is bringing, that we are moving away from the traditional reliance of only the state. You talked about all the laws that we have that utilize squarely in the state and you, the investor, you're left scot-free. Now, this action plan on business and human rights brings you on board and spells out your duties and responsibilities. Ruth, what I have, Ruth, what I have seen is that some people, those who have businesses, would want their employees to be paid casually, you know? Instead of, uh, mm. uh, in that way, you, you are denied the pay as you earn, you're not doing NSSA and stuff like that, because for him, you think that's okay. Mm. So how, how do you ensure that they are not just casual laborers who are just getting wages, but they are being paid a salary that has all the other things that follow the salary? Uh, well, unfortunately, the, uh, what you have said is a reality. Mm -hmm. Many uh, companies actually use this. They think it's a trick, but everyone know, can see right through them. Mm -hmm. Because when you employ casual laborers, then you pay them less, and you can fire and hire as, as quickly as you can, okay, without uh, any benefits. So, uh, and, and, and they are not adequately protected. Mm -hmm. So uh, the National National Plan looks at all these issues when it comes to labor rights and uh, ad, uh, it, it requires businesses to ensure that there's a contract between 
the employee and the employer. And uh, uh, the other MDAs are supposed to enforce, Ministry of Gender will have to enforce that. Mm. Uh, and also the respect of workers uh, at the workplace. Can mm. they form trade unions? Can mm. they come together? Is there collective bargaining for these people? Mm. Because I know that many, secu particularly security agencies and other, 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 other companies, mm. they always um, hire people and they call them casual laborers. And, and, but you have been there for 10 years, five years, two years, mm. and you're still being recruited as a uh, casual laborer. Mm. So uh, we shall go back still, uh, because of course companies want to maximize profits at the expense sometimes of the persons they, they use uh, without a care in the world. Mm. So we'll have to ensure that uh, there are minimum standards that all companies have to observe. You know, there's another... And that there's adequate monitoring and supervision mm. to ensure that they comply with these standards and that they themselves start the self-policing uh, mm. where they check themselves and there will be, uh, we anticipate that there will be uh, human rights. They check themselves, mm. compliance. Mm. of all companies the and and uh, yes the mm. cheapest that can be mm. so with time we'll start small but we think that uh, since we are aiming at 20, uh, 2030 agenda and uh, we are developing at a, 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 a very good rate the companies will comply with time it may be a, a bit biting at the beginning but uh, since they are also involved in the processes there will be a mutual understanding and discussions we believe that they'll, they'll, they'll comply and uh, very soon Ugandans will be protected and we'll have a better country. There's another trick I, th I seem to have noticed, Bernard. Yes, Companies please. will outsource mm. maybe the job of uh, general cleaning mm. and then uh, so somebody is hired to bring the cleaners and he deals with them on the, uh, alone. So you pay an individual who brings in his people. Yeah. Uh, how do you re relate with this? Oh yes, yeah, labor outsourcing or recruitment is been there for time immemorial. We tried to deregulate, but we found it was necessary to create a minimum standard. And as every other company that does HR or human resource recruitment is licensed by Minister of uh, Gender, Labor and Social Development, the framework is very laid out clear. Now, yes, it has been there. Outsourcing per se wouldn't have been a bad practice because then it, it <coughs> helps you to to bring specialization because probably casual laborers, if they were to be part of your day to day MD role, you would have a headache, you'd collapse. Even your HR wouldn't sleep every day. So, what you do, there's always a specialized company which purely manages labor. It is outsourced, it is supposed to generate. By the way, some of the outsourced companies help to ensure compliance to labor laws because HR companies then have to file returns because the main employer must also file returns. You are invoice, invoiced, and that means it increases revenue tax base. So hitherto, that casual labor section was somehow relegated in between there. So it has helped government to get more uh, tax taxes from these companies, but also to ensure NSSF compliance pays you earn, unless otherwise if they are below a threshold. So. Um, but as you know, any, any middle person always wants to cut into the profit. And when they cut into the profit of the casual laborers, it becomes hazardous labor. Okay. So, uh, Joseph, I can see now this would also require the issue of a minimum wage. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to talk about rights, yeah. then yeah. minimum wage yeah. should be embedded True. in this action plan, is it? True. <laughs> the issues of labor from the regional consultations across this country surfaced and the need for our country to have a minimum wage was mm -hmm. one of them. Mm -hmm. Currently, the commissioner will speak more to this, they were tasked by the head of state mm -hmm. to conduct a study and come up with sectoral minimum wages. In the opinion of the head of state, it can't work that we have a flat rate cutting across all sectors. So the extent to which the government of Uganda has executed that role, the commissioner will speak to it. But it's one of the key issues that Ugandans raise during the consultations. How is it going, Bernard? Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the ball is always comes back. <laughs> and the issue of minimum wage is such a hot potato uh, that once you touch it, you can't leave it without you burning probably your finger. But um, uh, we've done as directed by HE, the president, and wisely, he had a very, very fundamental point because 
you cannot be unilateral in terms of minimum wage. People in the oil sector are not the same with the agricultural plantation. And the, the same cannot be in telecom. And so we've done a mapping with the EPRC, Economic Policy Research Center, Macquarie University. We have a huge comprehensive report which we are now condensing. And then also we are going through the review of the minimum wages bill. Uh, we, so um, there's a whole robust kind of legal and policy framework and programming part of it. Because minimum wages, minimum wage impacts on the consolidated fund. And uh, you cannot go without uh, the parliamentary But don't you really see amendment. a relation between the no. minimum wage mm. and the national policy on business and human rights? There's, 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 there's an excess. In my view, there's such a big relation there. Yes, it is, it is, it is. It is, it is so, there. So, but you're going to launch this thing very, is it tomorrow? Yes. Uh, and, and yet, uh, yes. you're leaving it is the setting the, of pay. No, 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 no. You're leaving out it the Benjamin. It is setting the environment. <laughs> you it's see, all about the Benjamin. You see, even Jesus did not just come from heaven and fall on earth. Okay? Jesus had uh, the Messiahs. You remember, Samuel said, is this Jesus? Could he be the, the Messiah? So, there's, there's always the environment to be prepared. It's not... Uh, and you also, you cannot go yeah. to God without going through Jesus. Yeah, so but in that so case, there, there, in that there, case there, the minimum there are wage levels. Is, <laughs> is the John the Baptist. So <laughs> <laughs> John the Baptist. This is the John the wage. Baptist. <laughs> this is John the Baptist. Yeah, the Jesus wage. is coming. <laughs> so we should sort out. Uh, the need for yeah. the minimum mm. wage mm. is crucial mm. under the mm. labor company, the yes. uh, National Action Plan and Business and mm. Human Rights. Mm. So when we come back here during the review, you should task the commissioner to tell <laughs> us to what extent <laughs> have they <laughs> uh, finalized with condensing that report and tabling the bill like before Parliament. Joseph is getting me off the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> no, because it's in the implementation. Ugandans asked for it. Yes. We consulted them. Mm. It's a sticky issue. Mm. We have to deal with it. Patrick, no, we've, we've done issue. much more than just a minimum wage. <laughs> you have seen the issue of minimum, of mid-term access to your benefits. Yeah? So th there's a lot that is coming. Government is doing a lot of things pro okay. workers. You know, one of the things I've noticed, Ruth, is yeah. th the unequal power relation. Yeah especially in rural Uganda. You have this investor in the village, you have these ladies working. Mm. I mean, they cannot even negotiate. They cannot even just ask for their rate because of that unequal power relation. How do you deal with that? Um, I, I, under the National Action Plan, and also this is what we call the Global Compact on Business and Human Rights, which really is a document that guides businesses on the standards, sets the standards on what uh, they should have. Um, it's a requirement that all employees have bargaining power and that they should be allowed to form trade unions, they should be allowed to negotiate, to speak up about the issues that sh they have. Unfortunately, because of the fact that there is a lot of unemployment, and underemployment, and, 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 uh, many people have settled for less. And even when you settle for less, you lose the bargaining power, mainly because they're uninformed, they are, there's no awareness as well, and also because if you raise noise or you become the noise maker, you shall be ejected, you shall, you sh you shall be let go. So because of the little opportunities that are there and the job scarcity, m people have learned to settle for less. We've handled cases where in some, for example, hotels, uh, we had a hotel where, where we found that they had a policy that uh, women should not get pregnant. So the moment you, you, you are seen or suspected, then you go. Mm. So uh, you would be surprised that uh, some of the policies that co companies have that really are in breach of human rights standards. So uh, unfortunately, many uh, workers do not have the bargaining power. They're not allowed to form trade unions. Now, the... the and, and, and this is really under the Employment Act. Mm. The workers are supposed to have this, they're entitled to it, they're so supposed even, to raise complaints. Even in MDS, so in MDS mm. uh, <laughs> is there a place, for example, <laughs> breastfeeding mothers, uh, if they come to the office, they have a place where they can come with their babies at one point and maybe uh, they do uh, feed their children? Yes, yes. Uh, and this, I think, uh, I, I, uh, public service has uh, required mm. all the ministries, departments, and agencies to have. Mm. So, so they're, um, talking, they're talking about it now. 
No, 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 no. Uh, actually, companies, Parliament yeah. has, UCRC, mm. Uganda Human Rights Commission has. Mm. I don't mm -hmm. know whether the Minister of Justice. Yes, we have, we have. have yeah. but, but on <laughs> yes. top of that, and the Minister of Justice, because on he's top of that, docket, we are bringing after regulations. After that, I don't know whether. No, yeah, we are even bringing regulations. regulations, breastfeeding, at world of work and child care. Mm. Yeah, that's you are bringing space. regulations. Yes. Yeah, but you see how you, how, yeah. how you, mm. you're so behind, mm. and yet here you are. No. Adopting the United Nations uh, something. You see, and, and, and yet your house is. Let me tell you, order. Patrick, it's never late. In issues of human rights, there is universality. So one thing leads to the other. One thing prepares for the other. This I this prepares for the other. You know, you cannot go radical on issues to do with respect for human rights at World of Work. It is a negotiation. Okay. Even the labor law requires you to have a tripartite charter between the employer, the labor unions, and government. So there is a negotiation for social justice at World of Work. All right. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, as we try to conclude, I'm going to ask each one of you to give us your, your parting shot. Let me begin with you, Joseph. Thank you so much, Patrick. I would love to employ Ugandans to tune in tomorrow at NTV. The Prime Minister of this country will be launching the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights together with the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. It's important that we pick interest in this policy document and see to it that it's implemented. It shouldn't fall in the statistic of the 55% mm. of laws and policies of Uganda as told to us by the National Development Plan that are not implemented. We want the National Action Plan to be implemented the journey to develop it has involved all stakeholders, the private sector, government, civil society, affected communities, and the aspirations of the people when it comes to the interaction of business and human rights are reflected in that document. So right. we need to strictly implement it. All right, Bernard. All right, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. And uh, just to add to Joseph's words, <coughs> to um, employ Ugandans to take keen interest in this document, but also to say that it is a living document. Everyone is already implementing, even when you haven't launched it, because it's an investment. As long as you employ someone, as long as you are into business practices, you're already implementing it. So it's all about knowing its value propositions and probably measuring yourself, how am I doing? Yeah, so it's a kind of health and business barometer. All right, yeah, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, for me, I, I, I can only say that for once, Uganda has adopted a document that is not law, but a policy that brings business and companies on board, mm. where they can measure themselves, where will ensure that uh, they remedy the wrongs, where will ensure that they observe human rights standards wherever they are. I think this document eases uh, the monitors and the, d the work of different uh, government itself we keep lamenting about issues of companies, and yet many times they're untouchable. Mm. This time round, we can work together with businesses mm. to make uh, investments better, a mm. better place for us as a country, mm. as we aspire to the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Yeah. Ruth, Bernard, and Joseph, I want to thank you so much, gentlemen and lady, thank for your you. time. But most thank importantly, you. I want to thank you for your insight. And I also recognize your passion mm -hmm. in the protection of human rights, which is good. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is a good policy. Let's embrace it because I think it will help the individual. It will help the organization, it will help the community, and it will help the country. Good night and God bless Uganda.